Monroe's foreign policy is also tied in uh, to some extent with this question of slavery's expansion westward, and in particular, the um, <clears throat> treaty that uh, the Monroe administration makes with Spain in 1821, um, <clears throat> in which Spain recognizes the legitimacy of the Louisiana Purchase, and in which Spain cedes Florida to the United States, is going to seem to limit westward expansion into Texas, right, where would have been the natural extension of settlement and uh, slave farms west would be moving uh, across uh, the Mississippi, of course, into Louisiana, but then uh, over into Texas, right? Because if you go too far north, slavery is going to be limited by Missouri, okay? And Monroe is going to give up, surrender rights to Texas and, and recognize them as uh, the possessions of the newly created sovereign state of Mexico, okay? So that's going to seem to, like, maybe contain or, like, at least for the immediate future, contain slavery from moving west. But the problem with that is that it doesn't it doesn't work, and it's going to lead to another war eventually, of course, the Mexican-American War. Now, this um, <clears throat> treaty is uh, tied to the war that Jackson fights in Florida after his victory in New Orleans, okay? So... <clears throat> Uh, of course, if, if we remember, Andrew Jackson defeats the Creek Nation in 1814. He signs with them the Treaty of Fort Jackson, annexing uh, huge amounts of territory from the Creek Nation without federal permission for this. The Creek peoples are fleeing into Florida, into territory controlled by the Seminole Nation, and which is claimed by the Kingdom of Spain. Okay, and incidents of violence are breaking out pretty regularly between white white settlers in Creeks and then Seminoles on the border of southern Georgia from 1815 to 1817. And they really intensify in 1817, leading to the outbreak of the first Seminole War or the first Florida War. Okay, and Jackson, Andrew Jackson, the hero of New Orleans, is summoned from Tennessee to go down and engage the Seminoles, <clears throat> but told explicitly, don't engage the Spanish forts, fight only against the Seminole villages when you're in Florida, okay? But, of course, Jackson going down into Florida at all is going to look like a violation of, uh, you know, Spanish sovereignty over this territory. Jackson, nonetheless, does not hesitate, right? He's pleased to go. He takes a thousand volunteers from the Tennessee militia down to Florida, a 450 mile march, which takes them about 46 days in March of 1818. He recruits another 2,000 men on the way, most of them Indians, as he's going down for Alabama. And he's got about 3,000 people when he gets to Florida and he's attacking Seminole villages, but then also inevitably getting involved with the Spanish and attacking Spanish forts, and he takes control of several of these forts, okay? And <clears throat> the Secretary of State, John Quincy Adams, who, by the way, is the son of John Adams and Abigail Adams, and who has uh, was originally, of course, a Federalist, like his father, but switched in the early 1800s to become a Republican. He is uh, the Secretary of State for Monroe, and he is at the same time that Jackson is invading Florida in Spanish territory, he's engaged with nego in negotiations with the Spanish ambassador regarding the cessation of Florida to the United States, okay? And Jackson's actions, especially his attacks on Spanish forts, are not authorized by the federal government. So there's this enormous debate within Congress about how are we going to deal with Jackson? Are we going to punish him? for kind of going rogue and not respecting the orders that are given to him and really consistently flaunting the orders of the federal government. Uh, initially, of course, in the Creek War and now again in this war against the Seminoles and the Spanish. And the senator and great statesman Henry Clay of Kentucky, and great because he is a, a, a very um, <clears throat> a moving rhetorician and proves this uh, here in this debate over Jackson. This is really one of Henry Clay's first 
very important speeches that mark him as one of the, the great rhetoricians of the 19th century. And, and Clay is very concerned about Jackson and Jackson's expansion of personal power and really disregard for, for orders, right? And he's concerned that he's going to, this Jackson figure, who's undoubtedly a very good general, is going to use that to build some kind of personal following and autocratic power. And he warns, Clay warns, uh, beware how you give a fatal sanction in this infant period of our republic, scarcely two score years old, to military insubordination. Remember that Greece had her Alexander, Rome her Caesar, England her Cromwell, France her Bonaparte, and that we would escape the rock, and that if we would escape the rock on which they split, we must avoid their errors, right? So in other words, if we're going to avoid a military dictatorship and the overthrow of this republic, we got, we got to like, put Jackson in his place. But, um, you know, the um, Congress does not vote to sanction Jackson, does not vote to condemn his actions, does not go along with what Clay wanted, Okay. Spain is, of course, annoyed by this, and Spain is hoping that Britain will help her in a war against the United States if necessary. But Britain has just revived its trade with the United States, is making a lot of money from this cotton. There's no way Britain's going to go to war with the United States. And, of course, Spain at this point is, is – um, break its empire in Latin America is breaking apart, right? Once Napoleon had put his brother on the throne in Spain – Many colonists in Latin America had rejected his authority and begun to, uh, independence movements. And Spain is in no position to uh, go to war with the United States because it's already dealing with mass in, you know, uh, insurrection in, in many, many of its colonies in Latin America. Okay? So Adams is kind of using the advantage, to his advantage, the fact that Jackson has claimed territory already in Florida and may do so again in order uh, sort of as a, a leverage uh, in his negotiations with Spain here, okay? And finally, in February uh, 1819, Adams is able to arrive at an agreement in something called the adams onis Treaty or the Transcontinental Treaty of Washington. Spain cedes all of Florida to the United States and acknowledges the Louisiana Purchase, okay? And Spain relinquishes all territory north of the 42nd parallel. At the same time this is happening, Adams has just also uh, been able to negotiate a joint occupation of Oregon with Britain. So now the United States can move settlers all the way to the Pacific Ocean legally, okay? Now in exchange for Spain's concessions of Florida and, and uh, recognizing Louisiana, <coughs> Spain had agreed to so our Adams had agreed to uh, surrender claims to Texas and especially parts of eastern Texas that had been originally part of the um, <clears throat> Louisiana Purchase, okay? Now, Spain is delaying negotiations, and as it's delaying negotiations, the, the independence movements in Latin America are moving forward, and the U.S. is very eager to recognize these new nations that come into existence, okay? And one of them is going to be... Mexico, okay? And um, <clears throat> the, um, <clears throat> the United States is kind of seeking to um, ally itself with these new Latin American republics, at least in the short term, to gain the advantage against Spain. And in doing that, it outlines this foreign policy called the Monroe Doctrine, okay? It's articulated uh, by... Um, <clears throat> by Adams, and it's called the Monroe Doctrine much later, but what it does is it asserts the United States has control over a certain sphere of influence, right, which is going to be in the Western Hemisphere. And the Monroe Doctrine essentially says that if Europe, Europe has no claim in the Western Hemisphere, Europe should not interfere here, and if Europe interferes in these new Latin American republics, then the United States will deem that as a threat and will act accordingly. And in exchange for that, the United States promises not to interfere in any of Europe's um, <clears throat> colonies um, outside of the Western Hemisphere or, uh, or in the um, <clears throat> American region, North and South, or, you know, <clears throat> anywhere where, where Europe is, the European sphere of influence is uh, important, okay? And... Um, <clears throat> So the assertion of this Monroe Doctrine is a clear indication here that the United States feels powerful enough to claim a certain um, <clears throat> kind of 
uh, sphere of influence within the globe that extends beyond its own borders to include Latin America as well as uh, much of North America, okay? And it also shows that the United States is going to really be now looking west, okay? We're not interested in what's happening in Europe. We're not going to be involved in foreign affairs there. We're certainly going to continue trade with them because it's very lucrative, but we're not going to be involved in European foreign affairs. Rather, we're going to be focused on the uh, expansion westward and our relationships with these new republics in Latin America. That's going to be our um, focus, okay? And... <clears throat> And um, so, right, you know, as this doctrine is being articulated, then the treaty is finally ratified and things move, move forward for, for Adams. Now, the question, of course, for Westward expansion, as we, as we mentioned before, the question is inevitably tied to that of slavery and its expansion. Okay. And um, <clears throat> the immediate, in the, for the immediate future, the question of slavery's expansion has been settled by the Missouri Compromise, which forbade slavery in the Louisiana Territory and beyond the 3630 line of Missouri, as well as by this Treaty of 1821, the um, Treaty with Spain, which surrendered claims to part of Texas. So again, that would seem to limit the expansion of slavery west into Texas because the United States has given up claim to that territory, okay? So again, for the short term, we've kind of subdued this emerging question uh, division of pro-slavery, anti-slavery, but under the surface in the early 1820s, the origins of this bitter conflict and division over the expansion and containment of slavery are indeed really here we are, here they go, beginning to take shape.